So, dear colleagues, uh, it seems to me that the most challenging point for me is <laughs> that uh, I'm, uh, I'm speaking uh, on a topic which was not uh, uh, subject of my uh, academic interest. So, it's challenging and I hope that it will be interesting <coughs> and inspirative for you. I, of course, I cannot give a new paradigm, uh, even, uh, even a new theoretical perspective. Uh, I can present the sub, some uh, dilemmas and some paradoxes as I see them. Well, it seems that uh, leadership is one of many scarce resources. And it seems to me that the situation is paradoxical. It is paradoxical in the same way as the situation with money. As more and more money is being printed by the central banks, the more people all around the world are faced with the scarcity of money. Those people whose life conditions are the poorest desperately need money to improve their standard of living and to afford decent future for their children. Their salaries are lower because they are less qualified uh, and because they have been born in one of the third world countries. That is why they are not credible debtors. Also, they cannot offer adequate collateral to get loan from the bank. The obvious abundance of money does not mean that it is not scarce for them. Parallel to that scarcity, uh, scarcity of money, although it is abundant resource, there is general feeling of lack of trustworthy leaders and adequate leadership, despite the fact that the multitude of business schools, political sciences faculties, and leadership studies are producing thousands of all kinds of likely leaders. It seems that hyper-production of formerly qualified potential leaders does not diminish urgent need for competent leadership. Just the opposite. It seems that the plentiful supply of educated leaders somehow coincides with deep dissatisfaction and growing frustration of general public due to results of inefficient economic and political leadership on national and global level. Almost all explanations about 2008 global financial crisis made by the highest corpor uh, corporative and state representatives have been in line with unspoken understanding that profits went up because of great leadership and down because of weak economy. If anything, that type of behavior is a classical example of passing the buck. Uh, if excellent uh, leadership is in companies is producing, uh, producing weak economy, that, then something must be done, or with uh, company, with leadership, or with uh, uh, economy, or with politics. General bail bailouts have been inevitable because all those mismanaged and bankrupted banks, funds, and other financial institutions have been too big to fall. And millions of ordinary citizens and taxpayers have been helplessly watching their worship business leaders playing main roles in cynical performance about how to get power, to get rich, and to get whatever they wanted. Those leaders neglected predictable consequences of their hazardous business policies. They played intolerable risky games with shareholders' money. The only important goal was to get bonuses in both of possible outcomes, when their companies earn and when they lose. They took for granted that state budget would be the last resort if their bets in the global casino drop failed. The way in which almost all Western governments responded to crisis actualized the question about general direction of social, economic, and political development of liberal democracies. Governments were much more sensible for big business and financial sector problems than for their voters' and taxpayers' interests. Line of accountability was much more visible and clear in relation between governments and big business sector than between governments and their citizens. 
the same circles which had, be, uh, which had been lobbying for deregulation of banking sector at the end of 20th century and which have led to financial disaster of 2008 were the most influential side in defining ways out of crisis. Voters can elect new government, but the pets of government big business uh, uh, relations remain the same. Result it is disappointment, apathy and dissatisfaction with democratic institutions and political leadership. So, what is leadership? Leadership is complex interaction involving leaders, followers, and environment. And, as Winkler said, leadership is a construct which followers have developed in their minds. Furthermore, leadership is an attributing causal explanation. This last statement means that followers tend to, un tend to understand uh, certain outcomes uh, as to be caused by, uh, by deliberate actions of uh, leaders. Of course, leaders, leader acts on the basis of his or her distinctive traits. If there is no such traits, uh, there would not be adequate action. In conclusion, certain leaders' traits have caused appropriate action and desired outcome. This is why many researchers have been trying to define those personal distinctive traits which differentiate potential successful leaders from the others. Oh, uh, I'm not sure that you can read <laughs> this. Can it be uh, make bigger? No, it's not possible. Okay, then, then you have to trust me <laughs> that there is a, a list of uh, leaders' uh, uh, traits. Uh, leaders has, uh, has to be physical, vital, uh, has, uh, must have a high uh, IQ, uh, must be decisive, must be competent, uh, must be uh, self-confidence, uh, self-awareness uh, 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 must be adaptable and flexible. So uh, we have already heard a lot of uh, those traits and uh, uh, this list uh, does uh, not uh, add uh, anything new to, to that what was already said about uh, uh, leadership traits. Uh, and there is another one I hope that you can read. Uh, this one, uh, it was published on March uh, 20, the 5th of uh, uh, this year, uh, uh, made by Travis uh, Bradbury, one of, let's say, gurus uh, in uh, leadership theory, uh, and uh, uh, consistently with uh, other uh, dominant uh, theories of leadership, uh, uh, he says that uh, leader must have courage, executive communication, generosity, humility, self-awareness, adherence to the golden rule one, which means treat others as you want to be treated, passion, infectiousness, uh, authenticity, approachability, accountability, sense of purpose. We already know that uh, uh, leaders are supposed to have uh, such traits or uh, habit. But, uh, uh, but uh, let me ask you, do you know anybody who fits all of these criteria? <laughs> Can anybody fit to all of uh, these criteria, especially simultaneously? Uh, Bradbury, of course, is uh, fully aware that leader-follow relationships is a symmetric one, and that is hardly possible that uh, uh, the leader would like to treat the followers exactly in the same way as he or she expects uh, them to treat him or, uh, or her. Otherwise, uh, he or she would not be a leader. Uh, that is why, uh, why Bradbury uh, ascribes the leader almost uh, divine power. I quote, great leaders don't treat people how they themselves would uh, 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 would want to, to be treated. In fact, they take the golden rule a step further and treat each person as he or she would like to be treated. Great leaders learn what makes people tick, 
recognize their needs in the moment and adapt their leadership uh, style accordingly. End of quotation. Uh, bear this, uh, memorize this, and uh, please try to follow this. Try to imagine Mr. Bradbury as advisor to President Yeltsin in 1996 uh, presidential election campaign. The key problem was how to motivate people to vote uh, for him, because uh, many of them uh, were very much dissatisfied with his performance. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the key pro uh, uh, and uh, presume that Mr. Bradbury would advise President Yeltsin, as then advisors uh, really did, to promise privatization of land to former COFOS and SOFOS employees. What could be more natural for an American advisor than to affirm the basic values of free and democratic society? Right to live, right to be free, and right of private ownership. But faced with the, uh, with the fact that those Kolkhozniks and Solkhozniks didn't react positively uh, to most uh, promising out of all promise, uh, possible promises, advisors asked them what they would want. They wanted to preserve their salaries and their jobs and nothing more. Would be possible for Mr. Bradbury to promise them what they wanted and to remain adherent to Golden Rule 1. I think that it would be uh, impossible. Would, be, uh, would it be uh, considered as confirmation of his authenticity if he gave promises that their permanent jobs would be secured? Obviously, it would not be easy for Mr. Bradbury and for anyone uh, 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 advisor of that type to present all of his 12 habits in consistent and persuasive way. So, uh, the question is, do leaders really have the traits ascribed to them? Is it possible to check leaders' traits somehow? Uh, can followers do that? Uh, there is a huge corpus of uh, psychological and sociological theories of leadership, and even more numerous guru literature on the same topic. We can assume that in small group, families, clubs, local religious communities, streets, street gangs, in classrooms and in the offices, among the shareholders of small companies, in small military units, and all kinds of work, sport, and artistic teams, in local branch of political parties, it is possible to observe all members' abilities uh, and to recognize someone as a leader. Uh, this means that in such situations, group members can agree to follow one of them as a leader. It could be voluntarily by deliberate uh, uh, members' decision, or leader could uh, uh, persuade the others to be followers, or somehow impose himself or herself. Member, members of such small groups could be in position to observe leaders' behavior directly and to judge if he or she is gifted and able to be a leader. Does such interaction, which could be described as a leader-follower's relationship, really exist between majority owner of huge company or CEO uh, and many thousands of company employees, or between army general and tens of thousands of his soldiers, or between president of the state and millions of his or her citizens. Uh, does such interaction uh, exist between company owner or CEO on one side and their customers or consumers of their products and services on the other. In my opinion, it's not genuine uh, uh, leader-follower uh, uh, interaction. Only insiders, members of their inner circle, can be well informed and can be called to tell something of any relevance concerning leaders' way of thinking and way of behavior. Or, in not such rare occasions, 
police investigators and investigative, investigative journalists can do that. <coughs> So, myriad of books and articles is devoted to the topic of leadership. The vast majority of them deals with business leadership and with differences between management and leadership. Uh, so, uh, managers, uh, man, uh, managers are uh, devoted to, uh, to maintain discipline, to, uh, to fulfill uh, defined goals, and uh, uh, managers... Uh, uh, should be inventive, should create new rules, should create institutions, and should, uh, uh, should provide visions. Uh, this slide, which is unfortunately unreadable <laughs> to you, <laughs> from uh, Mark uh, Thomas' book, presents fundamental difference between leadership and management as parallel to difference between art and science. It seems that leadership could be something connected with higher values, uh, uh, which is not related only to improving efficiency, increasing productivity, or uh, uh, increasing productivity or work, or simpler to making money. Uh, that distinction is fully consistent with uh, Joseph White's note uh, on uh, management and leadership. He says, management is fundamentally about order and control, and leadership is fundamentally about achieving goals and making change. Making change is fundamental uh, uh, difference. Uh, bearing in mind these distinctions, it seems that we could make brave step forward and look outside of exclusively business world. Maybe we could try to step into the world of creativity and freedom, world of higher goals and noble purpose, world of greatness and glory, into the art of political leadership. Arnold Ludwig has written the most extensive study on all of 20th century political leaders, presidents, prime ministers, kings, dictators, liberal and authoritarian leaders, all around the world. His findings are not encouraging at all, as you can see, he says. As it happens, of all the fields of human endeavor, politics seems to be the one most rooted in primitive primate behavior. <laughs> he proceeds. Instead of deepening on brilliance, breadth of knowledge, creative problem-solving or special talents, which are necessary for the achievements in the arts and sciences, many would-be rulers seem to uh, rely more on cunning, courage, physical tools, deception, and power tactics to ascend the social hierarchy and gain, gain ultimate power. Uh, on one side, what, what do we have? On one side, uh, uh, different theories of leadership uh, are trying to define distinctive traits leaders should have, and some of them are trying to convince us that leaders really have these uh, traits. Uh, predominantly, guru literature presents leaders, first of all, business leaders, managers, and CEOs, as almost supermen. Persons with uh, divine powers, capable to fulfill contradictory expectations, desires, and wishes of all followers simultaneously. On the other side, the most detailed description and scrupulously made analysis of biographies, careers, uh, private and public behavior of state uh, leaders present them as per in perfectly different ways. It seems that the only common point for all of them was their will for power as more or less socially mediated uh, basic biological uh, drive. But if we accept the opinion that leadership is complex interaction that involves leader, followers, and environment, then we understand that it is not only up to leader to define a type of uh, uh, leadership that is implemented in certain organization or certain country. In 
predominantly traditional societies with poor democratic experience or without, without it, leader-followers inter interaction can be defined in terms of psychodynamic leadership approach. Uh, the scheme is here, uh, which means that uh, 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 dominant relation in such uh, type of uh, leadership uh, is a, a parent-child relation. Uh, the entire state machine, quasi-party uh, quasi mechanism, which is structured as leaders, private Praetorian Guard, and educational system are directed to prevent ordinary pe people from becoming uh, uh, adult citizens. The state and the party, or sometimes the church, are taking care for all basic and higher human needs, and those instances knew better what their people's needs are than people themselves. I think that Stalinist totalitarian systems perfectly fit into this scheme. The clearest example is current North Korean uh, regime. The entire state the propaganda machine is producing permanent illusion that the leader is taking care for each uh, citizen as omnipresent father, as omniscient teacher. The next model is a model of charismatic uh, leadership. The, uh, uh, the main uh, precondition for uh, creating situation of charismatic leadership is crisis. Uh, desperate, frustrated, financially and uh, psychologically destabilized, disoriented and uprooted people, people who have a strong feeling that they have been cheated and betrayed, and that they are victims of conspir uh, conspiracy, these people are looking for charismatic leader. 20th century history provides treasury of psychosociological and psychopathological <coughs> examples how ordinary, normally human beings have been transformed into fanatic followers. They were massively escaping from their freedom and from their responsibility. They were flammable material and leader was a spark. The result was unconditional identification of followers uh, uh, <clears throat> with the leader, although the vast majority of followers could not have direct contact with uh, the leader and they could not know what were leaders' real habits, abilities and traits. Current economic and uh, social situation in many of European countries is real charisma conducted environment, is oxygen in which that charismatic leader spark can flame uh, charismatic followers and produce unpredictable uh, uh, situation. Uh, the, but there is no guarantee that charisma flame will be sparked by socialized charismatic leader and not by personalized charismatic leader, which is generally concerned as negative type of uh, charisma uh, leaders, uh, charismatic leaders. And both types of charismatic leaders have transformational potentials, as history uh, has proved. And here we are. Transformational leadership, transactional leadership, and non-leadership, or laissez-faire uh, leadership. Uh, the leadership theory generally agrees uh, that uh, transformational leadership is uh, the higher type of leadership. Uh, it requires a certain charismatic uh, uh, traits uh, uh, and uh, it uh, produces situation in, in which followers uh, are uh, making much more than uh, they would uh, make otherwise if there is no uh, charismatic uh, leadership uh, situation. Transactional leadership, in fact, describes uh, a situation of management. Uh, is a contingent, uh, contingent reward, uh, it's uh, management by exception. And generally accepted uh, uh, opinion is that uh, non-leadership or laissez-faire leadership is less efficient uh, type of leadership and is not recommended in business and in companies. But where is the paradox? Paradox uh, is in the fact that uh, many ideologists, uh, ideologists of free market who are supporting uh, transactional uh, leadership theories in business are recommending to politicians uh, uh, to, 
yeah, to apply laissez-faire leadership in their relations to economy. And if excellent leadership in companies is producing weak economies, is it related to that point that politicians are supposed to to perform laissez-faire leadership in their relations? relation to economy. Uh, I think that it is one of basic uh, problems of our time. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I would like uh, to, uh, to make comment of Joseph White's pyramid scheme. Uh, he uh, he uh, describes uh, uh, two levels of uh, leadership on the basis of uh, fundamental requirements. So somebody uh, must uh, want to to, to, to lead, they must want to be in charge. It's a fundamental uh, uh, precondition. But uh, the, the next step is uh, to be uh, a rep a reptilian uh, uh, leader or mammal leader. And uh, as uh, Joseph White says, on the top section of the pyramid uh, is great leader with the helicopter view, with the almost uh, unnatural uh, uh, unnatural uh, uh, habits and traits. Uh, my impression is that general perception of uh, general audience in Western societies after 2008 crisis is that there is no great leader on the top of pyramid, but that reptilian managers are on the on the top, and that uh, mammal. Uh, uh, leaders uh, who are supposed to present themselves as charismatic leaders to general audience, in fact, are implementing uh, uh, hidden, uh, uh, hidden agendas of those reptilian leaders. And that situation must be changed. Uh, uh, what to do to change the situation? I will finish in a second. Uh, what to do? Uh, it seems to me that uh, I have no uh, universally applied uh, uh, advices, but uh, it seems to me that uh, these uh, few topics I am suggesting uh, uh, can trace uh, the direction. Uh, we who know something about leadership, we have to explain to people that leaders are human beings and not, not supermen, and that our expectations from them must be as expectations from human beings. Uh, we have to try to use educational system to produce future socialized charismatic leaders. Although there are no guarantees that all of those students will become leaders uh, and uh, that uh, all of them uh, become socialized, uh, will, will become socialized charismatic leaders. We have to educate uh, and to enable people to be responsible adult citizens, which means that for fundamental uh, requirements of their lives, they have to take care by themselves. And they have to require adequate conditions in which they, they could afford that. Uh, we have to strengthen democratic institutions to affirm democratic practices and <coughs> to stress leaders' accountability, not only to reptiles, but to citizens too. To be, uh, we have to be ready to question each institution if outcomes of its functioning are generally perceived as unfair. Uh, sense of fairness is uh, extremely important. If a majority people uh, feels that, uh, that uh, outcomes uh, are permanently unfair, they will be very much dissatisfied and frustrated. And we have to try to prevent formation of unfriendly social environment which make people feel cheated, disenfranchised and neglected. Thank you. I would like to uh, continue from uh, the crisis reference and uh, because of my own background to see how calamities 
big calamities might be intersecting with leadership and try to put them in the context of opportunities created by challenges and how far those opportunities were probably lost historically. And uh, I'd like to use uh, three slides if we move, uh, sorry, three reference points if we move with the slides. <coughs> uh, they are up there. One is uh, World War I. Secondly, uh, 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. And the third one, uh, which I described as the 1983 scares, missile scare and, and other scares. Uh, the, the point uh, I will try to make is that the calamities created a context after which big changes came. And uh, that's very unfortunate in the context of the second column, the outcome column, because it had to take 30 million people dead as a result of the First World War. For many historians, the Second World War was a continuation of the first one. So together we are speaking about nearly 100 million. McNamara in his um, uh, Fog of War uh, 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 reference was saying 160 million is the, uh, is the casualty number for the 20th century and uh, he was wishing that this uh, history of the 20th century is not repeated. So the change came after the calamity and uh, First World War is clear, Cuban Missile Crisis and uh, the 1980, early 1980s developments are less well known less well known from the point of view how close we were to something much worse than the, be it the First or the Second World War because of the arsenals uh, lined up on, on the two sides at that time, uh, US and former Soviet Union. The interesting uh, uh, reference point is, uh, is the following. As I mentioned in the morning, after the First World War, in the memoirs and in the references, defining leaders, be it on the German side, uh, the former Chancellor or uh, Winston Churchill, were referring to the practical inevitability of what happened. So there was no leader who could stop. Uh, because of, uh, of a combination of, of different things, uh, mainly the social uh, genie uh, left out of the bottle, and it was impossible to, to put that genie back in the bottle, the, the genie of, of uh, hostility vis-à-vis -vis each other, uh, nothing in my judgment uh, in the late 19th century uh, would have called for uh, a major war in Europe, five empires coming down and <coughs> starting to decline, and this is what happened. But in the references of the leaders, uh, there was this notion of no one could stop it. The important element is if, if history is cyclical, and if there are ups and downs in history, and if we consider that some of these crises did represent the, the bottom of, uh, of a cyclical uh, term. The question for today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow is, are we at the end of history in terms of cyclical phenomenon not being repeated? And uh, as it was promised in uh, the pre-2008 crisis, uh, I, think, I think it was Alan Greenspan, practically uh, the, the new culture of regulation is removing downturns and uh, practically 
the, the notion of what happened uh, 70, 80 years ago is not relevant anymore. So th- these are the issues we have to address. And uh, the, the interesting reference point is, with a lot of simplification, the challenge in all the three cases was a combination of geopolitical challenges, ascendancy, descendancy in the late uh, 19th century, coupled with arms race, and uh, a lot of uh, national pride spicing these elements. And if you go to 1962, and if you go to uh, the early 1980s, with, uh, with a different context, but practically these defining elements were there as well. What is on the opportunity column sign that uh, there was a missed or lost opportunity of leadership in World War I, uh, without going into attributing 80, 20 percent, 60, 40 percent, or, or whatever is the, is the number. And uh, in the case of the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, it was probably a combination of luck and leadership, probably more luck, uh, and it was very fortunate that this element of luck was there. Uh, it's clear from uh, the memoirs of McNamara that the U.S. was not aware of um, uh, uh, Soviet Union uh, nuclear weapons already deployed on Cuba until 1995, even, even McNamara was not aware of that. And uh, there were other instances, uh, uh, like um, Soviet submarine uh, case was referred to in, in, the, in the literature where it could have happened that a 14 kiloton of the weapon was released from a uh, Soviet uh, submarine. In the 1983 uh, context as well, uh, it's, it's, it was a series of, of events where because of the short reaction time created by the nuclear postures followed, uh, six minutes practically, there was a lot of nervousness on, on one side, uh, Soviet Union coupled with, a, with an aging leadership, and um, the, the developments, uh, uh, the, the Korean flight shot down 07, the, the uh, Pershing deployment issue, and everything created a very uh, combustible mix. And uh, at uh, moments like uh, September 1983, uh, there was a, a, a complicated situation, practically a, a lower level person in the, in the Soviet nuclear command decided that no, this, uh, this is not a U.S. missile attack. And uh, later on in November, there was a, a big exercise uh, for Abel Archer, where uh, as it turned out later on, even for the U.S. leadership, the Soviet leadership was uh, contemplating the first strike attack from the United States. So it's a, it's a series of lucky developments which uh, put us through these, um, uh, these instances. And what is interesting is that the defining regulations in my area of expertise, which is arms control, disarmament, and non-proliferation, grew out of the scare the leaders went through in those defining days. So uh, in 1962, the day after the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, came to an end, both the uh, Secretary General and the President exchanged the letter saying that now we will pursue a, a nuclear test ban treaty. This idea was completely unacceptable probably for, to both sides before, before that. And there was a series of regulations. And there was a series of regulations uh, growing out of this early 1980s uh, fear. There had to be a, a Gorbachev replacing uh, the, the aging leadership but practically on both sides, U.S. side and Soviet side, the acceptance of those regulations grew out of the fear which was lived through at the highest level and collapsed. The last phase. Uh, grew out of the scare lived through by the leadership on both sides 
and uh, by um, the wider population as well. The, uh, the question is, can we improve or should we improve the mix of luck and leadership? And uh, probably that will be uh, the, the issue for my talk tomorrow uh, morning, whether we can really base ourselves on being lucky for the third time, as lucky as we were uh, late October 1962, or lucky as we were on the 26th of uh, September 1983, uh, or November 1983, or there might be unknown events as well. And uh, the way uh, I, I look upon it, and uh, tomorrow I will expand on it, uh, unfortunately the requirements for that are not there. Uh, on one hand, uh, there is a, cri a crisis was mentioned. We are speaking about crisis in plural. Okay, there is a, there is a clustering crisis. Uh, cascade of, of crisis, and uh, it was it was not boding well pre World War One, this cascading crisis. And second, there are three types of fatigue prevailing. Uh, number one, there is a regulation fatigue. So what I described to you in the context of arms control. Uh, can be applied to any other area. In any other area there we have to get calamity to happen before a big change comes. The only difference is that if a big calamity is happening in the security world, then we have to cross ourselves that we are as lucky as we were back, uh, as we were back in 1962. But if you take the financial crisis, if you, if you take any other area, Fukushima or other uh, areas, the regulation uh, is in the forefront of attention for some time, and then it's fading away. We discussed that during the during the lunch time, and it's uh, sliding down uh, on the slope of priorities. So, from that point of view, regulation fatigue is there right now in too many areas. Uh, different players, be it the business community, be it the political community, being other communities, with the exception of of, of, of the wider uh, NGO community do not think that more regulation is needed. The other way around, many of them looking at, upon it as the cause of the problem. The second fatigue, in my judgment, is a fatigue about intergovernment organizations. It's very similar to the institutional fatigue which was emerging in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, late 19th century, where there were successful uh, early uh, international global cooperation efforts, and then they were fading away. And the third fatigue is cooperation fatigue in general. So might is right, is becoming unfortunately dominant. And the accommodation of interest and finding <coughs> trade-offs is being pushed in the back. So the clustering of the crisis on one hand and this triple fatigue is creating the context for my talk tomorrow. Thank you. <clears throat> well, there are a few questions. Uh, the first one. I can oh, okay, okay. I'll, I'll okay. read questions later, please. Go on. Okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, sir, for your very different presentation. Um, what you both tell us is that we are facing challenges. Well, that's quite easy to summarize, whether they are financial, economical, whether they are uh, geopolitical, of strategic in terms of security. Um, I would like to add uh, a few other challenges, uh, ecology being one of them, energy, and finance, being the finance guy, I'm always, uh, uh, I have some sensitivity to this one. 
Erwin Laszlo, in, in a talk, uh, was saying, um, this generation may be the last of an era, or the first of a new era. So for him, we're on the verge of either a collapse or complete change. So maybe that could be an introductory talk to, to summarize what we are saying, that really we are at a bifurcation point, something has to be done. And I would like to, uh, in, in, in my speech, show that there are alternatives. Vis-a-vis um, -a, -vis a challenge, there is always multiple opportunities. There is never a single one. And uh, I would like to show four possible opportunities, four kind of future. And I base my analysis on first two directions. Either we keep with the same paradigm, and we either accelerate, which will, which will be scenario one, or push the brake, scenario two. Or we change the paradigm, and we go either internal or external, who will be scenario three and four. So let me go quickly with these four scenarios. First, we keep the same paradigm about finance, technology, and energy, and we go just quicker. Who's going to win that battle if it's this way that is chosen? Well, probably investment banker. And this is what we see with quantitative easing. The 1% or 1% that produce money, they make a lot of money with all this uh, creating money out of the blue. And uh, whether it's the United States or the central bank in Europe, there are a large amount of money that is being printed. So some people will benefit from that. We will probably also go for more wars because we will face re limited resources in terms of ecology. So there will be fight for um, <coughs> water, probably uh, land where we can grow, etc. So who's going to win? Well, probably the one that are, uh, benefit from wars, uh, selling weapons, etc. But also probably all, all the fiscal paradise and so on. So I don't want to go deeper in that because Every newspaper is detailing this scenario very and much better than, than me. This is same paradigm, but accelerating. Same paradigm, but pushing on the brake. What would be? Well, that may be the green market, because if we do not go with oil and uh, nuclear technology, we will need other types of technology. So all the companies will benefit from that. So the green market, the solar, the aeolian will then uh, grow. Um, in terms of finance, probably ethical banking may uh, take the lead in terms of instead of investment bankers. Whereas we could have uh, the dollar as a global currency, we may have regional uh, currency that will develop local markets, uh, etc. Uh, how? Uh, if we accelerate, of course, the, the traditional pharmaceutical company will, will own the market. If we go the other way around, maybe it's all about alternative medicine uh, and that will create the market. So, face vis-a-vis -vis a challenge to solution with the same paradigm. Now, let me propose scenario three and four, which is a change, complete change. Now we can say there are external solutions. Man is the issue, we shall change the man. And this is uh, the Google and all the Californian uh, tech company. Uh, they have a lot of money and they have a philosophy called transhumanism. They believe that if the man, if mankind was enriched, uh, enriched by an access um, uh, in real time to the internet, via implants or via glasses or whatever, we would uh, enrich the reality we have access to. So this company have uh, acquired technology in the, the bite, the gene and the neurons. So they have tremendous power. And the idea is here that if we go on and if we develop as cyborgs, then we may face the challenge. 
So the challenge of finance, technology, and energy, and ecology, may be, from, from their perspective, be overcome by enriching the reality. So this is what I call changing the paradigm, but through an external way. And now, that is changing the paradigm, but from an internal perspective. This is changing the mindset, uh, which, um, as you understood, have my preference. Uh, this is the solutions we have been uh, proposing and developing, and I think it's quite a common agreement in this place, uh, which is having an upper level of consciousness, developing uh, an, a collective intelligence, whereas an individual performance. And we have seen companies like HCL, Gore-Tex, uh, but also ministries, uh, ministries of Belgium of Transport, of Social Security. <coughs> uh, there, the winner, so-called, um, will be the one who are capable of developing shared value among total value chain. So there will be consulting company, coaching, therapists, psychologists, etc. And all these people who will help us transcend the current level of, uh, of consciousness. So, if I have to summarize, um, and go back also to what uh, Gary was asking us about challenge and opportunities, and how do leaders um, act in terms of change, I strongly believe that every tough situation, every challenge, forces us to think new. So, I wanted also in my speech to show that whatever the challenge, there are always multiple options. There is never one single good option. And life has the beauty to create every time something new. And this is how I wanted to uh, close my speech. I just don't know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Well, uh, I was uh, uh, already ready to conclude that uh, you uh, are offering us uh, the operationalization of new paradigm, uh, and then uh, you concluded that you don't know. Uh, <laughs> Winston, please. Yes, I, I was looking at the question of uh, crisis. The dangers and opportunities that it presents the decision making. And I was particularly interested in the uh, assumption that the First World War simply was something like lemmings going to the precipice and jumping over. It wasn't anything that could uh, limit or, or constrain that. Another side of that is, of course, that, uh, that when people thought about war, the concept of war, they thought, oh, it's the six months and then we'll be back home. They didn't really have an idea what was going on. And, and I suspect that what has shaped that reality is that even though the population and the leaders are not aware of it, the technology of war vastly outstrip what people thought war was about. Uh, and uh, it may well be that uh, the legacy of the First World War is the memory that has continued into our own time about <coughs> war and the, the, the other dimension of it. Uh, so I, 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 I'm, I'm not as uh, convinced of the inevitability of what happened, but I think there was certainly a misunderstanding of the conditions under which leaders were operating. The, the uh, questions you raised about the Cuban Missile Crisis and the other Missile Crisis, of course, are similarly uh, that the technology has taken us so far and in both of these instances you point out this was a near miss. Um, and, and so the question there becomes, uh, no matter how we refine our early warning systems and our collaboration, 
the take is still a real threat, uh, but with consequences that are earth shaking. Um, and so that does pose further questions about leadership choice and collective choice. Uh, in short, can we be safe so long as we have the weapon systems and the delivery systems still they poised, ready for action, whether it's the no first strike or response or whatever, or whether our real safety lies ultimately in my actual Congratulations to the panel. I mean, this is getting better and better uh, each time. If we continue like this, there are two dangers. First, uh, we will all miss the next plane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, I mean, we will read really marvelous. All three speakers touched very important things. Uh, let me just uh, mention that uh, there is, uh, uh, you were referring to people, uh, of course, the first to a war, and uh, there is a very beautiful book that uh, recently published uh, under the name of Sleepwalkers, suggesting, of course, that the so-called leaders were sleepwalked into the, the first world war, and it so happens that most of them were cousins. They knew each other very well, and on top of the general uh, fight that they had, uh, they had personal problems, like, for instance, the German Kaiser, was the most uh, loved uh, grandson of Victoria, and uh, of course the English king emperor did not quite appreciate that, and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, also, I believe that I particularly enjoy what you have said, uh, with the, because this is our team, I think, mean, the, the, the paradigm. And uh, what I want to stress is, A, uh, the old paradigms, you rightly said, is leading us into trouble, and that was said also by Boss Timor <coughs> and uh, by Waldrop, because obviously we also have the fatigue, uh, you brilliantly said that it's three fatigue. There is also fatigue in terms of leaders. Leaders in the old paradigms we don't have. It. I mean, they are already gone with that. Now, of course, when we jump to the new paradigm, again, there are these two things. And the problem that you put as the first option of the first paradigm, the transhumanism, is the thing which starts with the first, most brilliant, of the Director General of the UNESCO, uh, Sir William uh, Huxley, who actually wrote an article with the transhumanism and so on. So he's, uh, he's proponent of, of this. And I think that basically what we are in is a combination of both your option three and your option four. Because these people will continue to go into neural modification, uh, cell modification and so on. We will have these transhumans whether we want or not. We will have the machines whether we want or not. And on the other hand is the question uh, of changing the mindset. Now, we have used in this discussion several concepts, which are all very vague. One of them we love is the concept of wisdom. But we really don't know what does it mean wise. And particularly we don't know what does it mean to be wise in the concept of the new paradigm. Because in the new paradigm, our most trusted wisdom, uh, which we trust, namely the common sense, obviously is wrong. And so we are there. Uh, I just want to re-emphasize and uh, support again your view. We are going into a new paradigm. We don't know. And in the foreseeable future, we will not know what we are in. But nevertheless, we have to not go in that way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just a couple more thoughts. Observations. I'm also very much impressed by the panel and the <coughs> discussion. I uh, will be just reacting to what you said. 
maybe not necessarily the biggest and then smaller issues in different uh, circles. First, it was very interesting uh, your story about Yeltsin and the uh, very uh, dilemma, let me say, how to get out of this situation. Uh, I'm not sure that, that you know the continuation of that and resolution of that, that situation in 96. Because obviously Yeltsin had at that time 3% of the popularity prospective public. And um, it was bumped up to 56 in about maybe two, three weeks. And then in a very interesting way, he has chosen instead of populist decision, a realistic decision. And the realistic, realistic decision was a box of Xerox, which two people were, and Xerox was quite large at the time, boxes, you know, the machines. And they were all filled with US dollars. And it ended up in the pocket <coughs> of the median magnet of that time. Now it is a senator the machine. And it worked. So uh, I'm just saying that we should have uh, underestimate in our model, the possibility of the modeling of the public opinion. And that's extremely important uh, factor of the modern life. And I am afraid that more and more political uh, manipulators will be abusing this possibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say this also, to a certain extent, explains the astounding Popularity of the uh, uh, Russian president, 86%. This is the tireless work of this modeling machine. Uh, then I wanted to say a couple of words. I, I agree a bit with what you said in me. It's very important. And uh, I would say that when we look at uh, the development of this strategic relationship between the uh, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, we have to draw the lessons and uh, uh, to draw the lessons of true leadership on both sides at that time. Because a lot has been done, but I would like just to know maybe, I don't know to what, uh, uh, maybe it's not that interesting, but I wanted to say that indeed. In '83, it was the flock of geese that started in northern Canada and they were flying to Europe. And the fact that they were flying close to the North Pole or the Northern trajectory triggered the alarm of the Soviet Union because uh, before that and after that, all the tests of the missiles were done in the, uh, how do you call it? Okay. 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 Uh, well, in the east-west of the yeah. South yeah. project. So that created an alert. But by that time, it was already clear that uh, uh, the nuclear exchange will not work. I must tell you that as early as uh, the end of the 70s, simultaneously with the beginning of the problem of, of the uh, intermediate range ballistic missiles, in the Soviet Union they took a, a, an attempt to start the uh, quite an ambitious project to uh, to have a mathematical model of the dynamic strategic stability. And uh, a whole section of this technical institute of mathematics of uh, the Academy of Sciences was charged with the uh, mission to, uh, to create a computer model of that system. I was working for that time to one of the governmental bodies and, uh, and that was uh, involved in that issue and we were working together. And uh, we were providing the, with the, the data, and uh, the institute was trying to build on that data in the model. So I must tell you, just uh, uh, in about uh, one, two years, uh, as the work has been started, it was clear that it is not doable, simply because so many factors, so many uh, <coughs> uncertainties in that. Well, I'll give you an example. One of the, one of the parameters is <coughs> the accuracy of the water. And uh, just a couple of things. The trajectory. It has been tested on the on east-west. 
not knowing how the missile will be accurate when it will be flying in the northern direction of both sides. Because the magnetic fields, fields are absolutely different. It's not possible. Then the parameters <coughs> it was so called circular model, which that what does it mean? It means that out of ten missiles tested, only one has landed in the circle of this radius, which was 10, went out completely. And then, of course, the recycle effect on the waters. Because uh, uh, it was in this dynamic picture, they took the calculation that certain targets required for to be destroyed absolutely without any like the CPU value objects on the territory of, of, the, of, of the potential enemy. And uh, for them it was designated several warheads from different uh, re-entry vehicles. So, uh, uh, and it is well known that the first uh, warhead uh, explodes, the electromagnetic pulse can do whatever with the another uh, water, which will be later by a fraction of a second. It will be either destroyed or deviated. It will not go. So all of this, and if you will take not only others, but all the elements of that situation, they show that there is no possibility to be certain that even your second strike cap capability will be uh, secure <coughs> or will work. In, in that situation. And all this, this information was reported to the British. But uh, at that time we were calling them, uh, which can be translated as uh, echelons beyond reality. So, but that was quite rough in words <laughs> at that time. So they simply ignored and they ignored that what they did. They ignored this information. They uh -huh. continued to, uh, to develop all this potential. Uh -huh. and, oh, this the action. and only the coming of Gorbachev to power in 95 changed the situation. Because when you heard of uh, in already uh, autumn in Geneva, the decision was taken to get the Zeger that the nuclear war was not possible. You cannot win nuclear war and it is not possible. possible. <coughs> so, sorry, maybe I put to No, it's a most It was a most change ourselves as human beings. But what we can change is exactly what we said the mindsets of the people. Because uh, uh, even talking about the western part of the world, we're getting more and more freedom, different freedom, mm -hmm. and there is less and less mm -hmm. air to breathe. <laughs> and that should change. People should feel Different. How to do that? That's a story for a new conference. <laughs> now, thank you very much. I found uh, all this uh, presentation very attractive. I would uh, say that uh, we need to confront two uh, two basic, uh, how to say, division of leadership, maybe proactive one and reactive one. And uh, in that terms, we need to, you know, separate something that can be called like transhumanism in terms from uh, uh, to, to, to make a distinction between transhumanism and transpopulism. So we are not facing challenges of uh, modern world of constant movement of circumstances. 
we have certain actions, we have proactive leaders, we have certain uh, changing uh, conscience uh, into world, into society. And uh, during the history, during all these wars, we had some certain threats, we had certain problems, and during these problems, we uh, always and constantly found somehow the solutions, technological solutions, technological way out, uh, system solutions, the solutions for society, political regime solutions. So everything was reactive according to the circumstances of the history. But uh, what is now, uh, what, what's there present about the leadership, and about proactive and uh, reactive leadership, is uh, in a way uh, changing the approach of getting out of the box approach. So uh, it basically uh, means uh, irrational behavior. We have in many situations totally irrational behavior of uh, persons, of people who want to be leaders. So, we have a threat, we have a political regime of, of uh, new populist parties, not only Greece, all over the world, uh, in uh, terms of finding quick solutions to, uh, hope, uh, to all problems of the world. So, what I would uh, uh, distinct so, or, or separate is two basic principles. How to separate this good leadership and uh, uh, positive leadership uh, from that negative or populistic uh, quick solution leadership. That's the main challenge, I would say, in a, a way of, uh, you know, uh, 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 facing today's, to, today's society with this changing of uh, conscience. So we are aware, we need to awake these things uh, in ourselves, but from uh, one point of view, uh, the behavior of especially leaders, political leaders, is irrational at the end of the day, so we need to, you know, uh, 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 find, find a way how to, you know, uh, uh, minimize the, this kind of reaction that uh, would have probably a negative impact uh, in the, on, on society. So uh, that is uh, what I wanted to share with you. Very well, I thank the panelists for very much. It goes in many directions. Uh, although I like your, your comment very much <laughs> that leadership is a scary resource of it. And it, it need not be, and it should not be, in a scarce and it's fair. This is something we should be promoting well. But in the past, we were hoarding it. And those who had it were not anxious to develop others. And I mentioned on the first morning that if you look historically, there are very few leaders who have really taken great efforts to develop the next level of leaders. That that tends to be the exception. Uh, and the one, the only great example I know, and I'm sure there are many others, but the great one I know is Mahatma Gandhi, because he literally took people who had potential, and all around him he built leadership so that when he stepped out, uh, uh, there was a whole host to follow him. So that mentality about leaders, of creating leaders and developing leaders, rather than just using the power they have at one point, uh, I'd like to take a little contrary position. I liked your chart, the uh, board. I agree with everything you've said, uh, and uh, it brings it home in a quite frightening manner of how close we have come to. Uh, but I think you can turn around and look at the same thing. I don't minimize what you say. I'm not trying to negate it, but I think you can interpret it in an opposite way also, which for the purposes of this discussion is important. Uh, one view, my view about the world wars was they were created by a combination of three forces, technology, the industrial revolution, nationalism, and fascism, or authoritarianism in very great forms. And we have paid a heavy price for that. Uh, and when you look at the price, it's hard to talk about opportunity. Uh, because the cost of doing great. But the fact of the matter is, out of that, 
after untold and apparently unnecessary suffering, we have evolved a new social order, uh, at least the beginning fragments of it with the UN system and international diplomacy, which is really the theme of this, that the challenges can be, do become and are opportunities. The question is, could we have done this in 1910 uh, rather than in uh, 1950? In fact, Shira Rino, who's not supposed to be a political figure, but in fact he was uh, very much concerned with the evolution of the world social order, he said in 1910 or 1912, Britain missed a great opportunity because they could have converted the Commonwealth organization into the first framework of global governance. But they did what most of us would have done. They decided to play well. We don't want to give this thing up. I mean, this is ours. In fact, they have to give everything up. Uh, but the possibility was there. The leadership didn't see it or didn't go to it. And of course, we know Churchill, in spite of being such a uh, a hero in World War II, uh, he said, I will never preside over the dissolution of Her Majesty's Empire, uh, which shows the resistance we have to, to taking challenges and converting them uh, into opportunities. Mm -hmm. I, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, of course, we have a personal connection with it in the Academy because Harlan Cleveland, the former president of the Academy and a close friend, personal friend, uh, was the ambassador to NATO, uh, uh, was the actually assistant secretary of state during the Cuban Missile Crisis, sitting in the State Department, talking to the UN on one side and Kennedy on the other side, and passing information back to McNamara and all. Uh, so we know how close it came. But it's also true that as a result of that crisis, there was significant progress made on arms control, uh, which uh, because, my God, this is really terrifying. Uh, apropos what uh, Alexander said, there was an American version of this uh, in the, after that Harlan became the UN, U.S. ambassador to NATO, and he took <coughs> described to us that in the late 60s, there was a great deal of pressure among NATO members in Europe to really make nuclear strike the first line of defense against the Soviet Union. And the, by that time, the U.S. knew what Alexander was saying, uh, that the impact of this, especially, not only the inaccuracy of it, but the, the impact of this on Europe would be absolutely devastating. But there was an enthusiasm among the Europeans uh, that uh, to, to rely on this nuclear force. So, the State Department took all of the NATO ambassadors from Europe to Washington, put them in a war room, and showed them what would happen uh, uh, if, in fact, uh, this, this option were resorted to. So, I think that, that really shows how, and several of you mentioned it, how important information is to, uh, uh, my understanding of the options is, to the possibility of converting a challenge into an opportunity. And of course, the 83 scares, which we're lucky uh, that we have survived, also became a strong impetus to end this madness and end the Cold War. So I guess the question is not, we know in history, yeah, well, we know in history that many times, we had a whole discussion on this in September, uh, not not particularly at the political level, but we covered many different types of examples. The U.S. during the Civil War came this close to breaking up uh, into a European type uh, con confederation or nothing, or a group of different nations, with California being one of the big countries today. Uh, but it didn't. Uh, and Lincoln was able, through a very narrow means, to result in strengthening the U.S. into a strong federal government, which it had not been up until that time. It was really more of a federal confederation. And with the result of the progress that America made economically and politically after that. So I think the question before us, the real question before us is, how do we convert challenges? We, 
Human beings, as you all indicated, we tend to respond and make change only when we're compelled to. You know, there are exact, there are instances, other instances, but most of the change we make comes under compulsion. The New Deal, uh, America gave up the rampant capitalism uh, that is now becoming a fashion again because we saw the catastrophic impact of it and there was serious concern that communism would come in the 30s. So we put on a new deal. So the question is, we're going to have challenges because we don't respond to pressure until it becomes very compelling. The question is, how, and I'm putting it back to the panel, I think you've given some answers, but I'd like to hear further comment. How do we, how does an effective leader convert challenge into opportunity? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the, there are no other questions I to the internet and then we'll try to uh, well to, to give answers or to make comments uh, to, to be more precise so from Uganda Anatoly Kadu asked us today there is a twist that leadership is taking in Uganda from achieving goals and change as a group to showing power and dominance and being among the fear what causes that, and how can a leader or mentor mitigate such tendencies? <laughs> What's, uh, I, I think that appetite for power, uh, uh, need, uh, need or, or desire to rema uh, remain uh, on power independently of the uh, uh, will of, of uh, voters or citizens, uh, and maybe uh, uh, fear of uh, possible uh, uh, possible losing the power, uh, what uh, the, and, and, and the very bad uh, expect, expectations concerning uh, uh, concerning uh, what was done before, <laughs> when the members of that group uh, have maybe uh, <clears throat> performed uncontrolled power. But uh, I'm not too much familiar with the situation in Uganda. Maybe somebody else know. Um, when I was there putting together the Human Rights and Peace Center, uh, there was a vigorous debate uh, with the president uh, and some members of civil society uh, in which the president was uh, making the case for one party state. And uh, the reason that he proposed was essentially that Uganda was so fragmented that if you had so many parties, you'd have essentially fragmented government. Uh, it is true that it is one party state, and the president is a bit more like a benign dictator so that there will be moments when he is somewhat more uh, assertive of executive powers and other times when he leaves things to the courts or others. Um, he did respond to a particular event that I had been involved in because when I arrived there about 160 people were in death row and they were sentenced by military tribunals. Uh, I was asked to look into the matter, and when I looked into it, I just found a fire with death and nothing in it. Um, I then uh, researched Uganda and wrote, and wrote him a long letter saying that, uh, in fact, the military had no civilian jurisdiction over the civilians, and therefore none of these death sentences uh, had been passed legally and that uh, since he's the ultimate legal authority in uh, the country, he should take action. Well, I waited for two more weeks and nothing happened. But when I got back to the state, I got a call from his office to say that he'd be sent all the death in So, so it's, it's a bit more complicated. Um, in some ways, uh, he has kept the lid on a very fragmented society, on the other hand, he sometimes used more strong arguments. <coughs> but, but he is a bit of a dictator, I wouldn't say this. Because some really bad ones to be made. 
Thank you very much. It was completely uh, unknown uh, to me. So uh, I thought that uh, Anatoly uh, got uh, got uh, uh, satisfactory uh, uh, answer and explanation. Uh, there is a question from India. Yanani Janani. John Gardner said that historical forces set the stage for leaders in today's society. Fundamentalism, sectarianism, and intolerance are strong forces. How can a leader convert these challenges into opportunities? So uh, the same questions uh, we are getting from all uh, around uh, the world. And I think that the entire our uh, discussion and uh, uh, was intended to try to find uh, out uh, uh, adequate uh, answer. Uh, one of possible answers, uh, and I uh, don't think that it is the only uh, one, uh, is that leader uh, can uh, present uh, tolerance by himself or herself, and uh, he or she has to try to explain to his or her group uh, uh, that uh, if they want others to be tolerant uh, to them, then his or her group also should uh, tolerate, uh, tolerate the others and accept uh, differences. It, it must be the first step, and uh, it cannot be done uh, in, uh, uh, except by, by personal example made by, by that particular leader. And Vani from India asked us, how should the leader relate to the followers to motivate them? Well, uh, in, uh, in nowadays, uh, through media, <laughs> uh, the, uh, I, I think, that especially in India, there are uh, no too much opportunities for uh, nation, uh, leaders, uh, national leaders to be in uh, direct contact with, uh, with voters, with citizens. It's through media, but uh, I think that uh, the main, uh, main demand is to uh, speak frankly. I can promise this on that. Uh, I intend uh, to implement these decisions in this or that way. I cannot do that because of, uh, of uh, these circumstances. And if you want those problems to be, uh, to be resolved, somehow we have uh, to change our approach. We have to make coalition or something, uh, something uh, similar. Uh, the, so the leader has to fulfill all demands public is putting in front of him. Uh, uh, but the leader must know that he is human being. And I think that uh, it must be the main message of all leaders to all of their supporters, their voters, uh, or their uh, citizens. Uh, certain things could be done immediately. Certain things could be done uh, after a certain period of time. Uh, and certain things uh, could be done if we think in different way. Uh, and maybe we, we don't know what exactly that way should be. And let me uh, try to uh, to make comments uh, on, on our discussion. It, it seems to me that uh, our panel was uh, interesting and that uh, uh, all inputs uh, were very inspirative. Uh, it, it's uh, obvious that uh, when we are faced with challenges, uh, we, we feel need to turn to the history to try to explain if uh, that's what, what's uh, currently uh, going on uh, around us, if it's somehow related to history, if uh, the problems we are faced with could be solved by using some of the experiences from history or it's entirely new situation. Now, I'm not sure that uh, we have escaped from, uh, from mad situation, mutually assured uh, destruction. Uh, that uh, danger exists and uh, as, as uh, existing uh, international institutional uh, uh, frameworks uh, are decreasing, I think that uh, uh, that, that uh, madness, that med, uh, is uh, becoming more and more a serious uh, problem. Uh, the, 
human life uh, is defined by uh, by biology and by humanly constructed social systems. Uh, what we are discussing are these uh, systems and ways uh, of possible influence uh, to change uh, those uh, systems. Uh, challenges are uh, in front of us are extremely uh, serious and it seems to me uh, that uh, our discussion uh, was, uh, was not just collection of uh, questions uh, and, and concerns. It seems to me uh, that a uh, uh, lot of inputs uh, in our discussion are directed uh, uh, toward the new, uh, how to, 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 toward the certain, uh, cer certain uh, ways out. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, I personally am, am, am qualified to define the shapes of that new uh, paradigm, uh, but uh, uh, the crisis uh, uh, and uh, historical experience which uh, tell us uh, that uh, uh, tremendous global catastrophes uh, uh, usually happened before humankind decided uh, uh, to, uh, to establish fundamentals for institutional ways of dealing with, with global problems. Uh, but I think that that historical experience can be a kind of warning. Is it necessary for history to be repeated? I think that it's not. And we'll all try uh, to do our best not to repeat the dark side of history. Yes.